right, I think we're on the air. I think we're on the air. I'm put my headphones and microphone in. Huh? Hmm. Couldn't tell if all of you are hearing that Google Ads for video ad or if it was only for me. Um, anyway, hi. <laughs> I'm Cecilia Tan and welcome to part two of the two of the slow surrender book launch video chat. I am I think I'm off filter here. I'm trying not to. There's so much glare from the different video screens around me and whatnot. I've got two laptops here and my lights and whatever, but it's like if I turn the lights down, then I look purple. So, <clears throat> anyway, hello everyone. Um, ah, hi Susan. <laughs> if you are online at, uh, at Ustream, you can uh, type in the chat box. And I will see the chats, and I will attempt to answer them out loud. Um, Susan, how do I sound? Can everyone hear me all right? I, I, someone had texted me between the two chats saying that on the Google Hangout that I, I was very quiet. And I, I think I'm just not very loud because of the cold that I'm getting over. Um, we'll see. Here, wait, I'm going to have some more tea. Those of you who are tea nuts out there, I am having um, Pilo Chun which is at what they call the, the eyebrow tea, which is because the little furry tea leaves look like little eyebrows, I guess. I, I don't know. You know, every, everything, everything Chinese has a poetic name, right? <laughs> I know, right. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Pardon me. All right, anyway, I put my little headphones in, so... Um, if anyone has any questions, if you can't figure out, if you're watching this live, but you can't somehow figure out how to ch chat or you can't log in, you can always text me. I'm going to put my phone number. Yes, my real phone number. Text me to 617-290-9043 and I will um, happily answer there as well. Anyway, so just to recap, if you weren't with us over in the Google Hangout, which I just finished, I am... Um, promoting the release of my new ebook, which is called Slow Surrender. Now let's see if I can make it so you can see it. The, uh, the, this is my iPhone, by the way. Yes, it looks like a book. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, it's out in ebook now. The paperback will be out August 5th. Um, and it's, uh, it's from Grand Central Publishing, which is a part of Hachette. Um, which is one of the big six publishers. Um, the who has you know they've already merged with so many different things that it's that's Hachette includes what used to be Little Brown, Warner Books. Um, I, I I've lost track actually of how many companies are now a part of, of Hachette. Um, but it's kind of cool to be with a really big publisher for the first time in a long time because I've been doing so much self-publishing and small press publishing and whatnot in, in recent years that um, I had sort of forgotten, you know, <laughs> what it's like. So, um, uh, someone wants to know, how do you, where do you get one of these little, the, the iPhone case that looks like a book with its, this is the, it looks like a, uh, that's what actually holds it in place. It, the brand name is called Book Book. Um, and uh, amusing story, I invented this as a, a thing for one of my characters to have in in a um, I did a book recently called Entwined, um, which is a, a choose your own erotic romance, <laughs> which um, I did with a company called Colloquy. Speaking of small presses and you know whatnot, they're not that small. They're they're pretty big, but they're they're a digital uh, press. And the idea was we four writers each started from a common first chapter. And then we each wrote a, a novella that went off in a um, different direction. I, of course, wrote the heterosexual BDSM one. Or and I shouldn't say, of course, since I can write 
every, I write every different possible kind of pairing, you know, and um, every different possible kind of sexuality, but uh, they wanted me to write the male dom, female sub version, and um, in, you know, the, when our main character first catches sight of him, he's got this little book in his lap, in the, you know, in the airport lounge, and she's terribly curious, she's a writer, and she's terribly curious, you know, what, what, what is it, is it a Bible, is it a, you know, whatever, and of course then they get on the plane, and he opens it in its phone, you know, and she's like, ah, you know, mystery solved. And then the hilarious part is that then a couple of months later, after turning in the manuscript and, you know, whatnot to colloquy, um, I see this for sale on Amazon. So I, I bought this one off Amazon.com, but yeah, but Book Book is the brand name and you can get it, I think you can get it in black also. You can also get one that says Holy Bible if you want it to look really want people to think it's a Bible. So, you know, so the, the, so the funny thing about that is that this is not the first time that I've invented something while I was writing and then later found out it was real. Um, it, <laughs> it sort of happens all the time, actually. Uh, so, you know, and which I think is probably less that I'm somehow magically creating things, you know, into reality and more that I, I pick up stuff in the I don't know, in, in the ether, in the gestalt, and then it just, you know, I don't know, it just arrives in the fiction somehow. Um, it, that, okay, that sounded way too mystical. That's not really what I meant, but, <laughs> okay, maybe it is that I actually, I imagine stuff and it becomes real. That's it. You know, it's much easier. <laughs> that's an easier explanation. You know, I am a science fiction and fantasy writer as well as a, a romance writer, and so, you know, some of those things can be pretty far out, but, you know, I, um, I actually had some self-consciousness about writing uh, writing this book. Um, so it's called Slow Surrender. It takes place in New York City, and it's uh, you know it's it's a mainstream romance, you know, except for the BDSM part. That's like that's the one non quote unquote mainstream part about it. Um, except that now that Fifty Shades of Grey and these other books you know have been so popular, it's it's that's less out of the mainstream than it used to be, right? I mean, all three Fifty Shades books are still on the top. Uh, in Nielsen book scan are still in the top 20 um, in trade paperback sales in the United States right now. You know, they're, they're still selling at that level. You know, it's not like, oh, well, and then there was this one week when everybody read it and then, you know, it disappeared. No, it's still going on. Um, people are still reading them and, you know, uh, which is extremely fascinating to me um, because it's somehow like enough people are reading them that it's okay to read them and then all of a sudden that's made it okay to read and to publish, you know many other things um, sort of in that vein. So here I am, um, you know, writing my own version, if you will. I mean, you know, my, my, my incredibly rich, mysterious, you know, dominant male character with my, you know, young but not that young, <laughs> you know, somewhat, somewhat innocent but not that innocent, <laughs> you know, um, uh, female character. It's, a, it, that's not a new trope, like that's not a new pairing, you know, so it's not like E.L. James made that up. Um, she did a very convincing job of, of it, you know, uh, and so this is this is my version anyway. Um, the book is called Slow Surrender and it's the first book of three about these same characters that will, you know, continue on exploring their relationship and get kinkier and kinkier as it goes along. Um, so the first one is called Slow Surrender, the second book is called Slow Seduction, and the third book of course is Slow Satisfaction. So, um, the, uh, and, of course, the problem with having three books that are so similarly titled is that we get confused when, you know, me and my editor are talking about it, and so we, we just have to call them book one, book two, and book three, <laughs> because otherwise we're like, wait, 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 which, which, which one did you, which one are you talking about? Oh, yeah, I, I meant the other one, you know, so it's like if you name your kids things that are too similar, you know, or, um, you know, your pets or something, it's like, wait, wait, wait which, which one are you talking about? <laughs> so, um, I did not have kids, I have books instead. <laughs> But, um, yeah. <clears throat> ahem, ahem. so I'm wearing the pearls because the, um, the book cover, of course, has pearls on it, and any people are surprised to find that I own pearls, and, um, they were my mother's, of course, uh, and she gave them to me at some earlier point when I had to get dressed up for something when I was probably a teenager, and they've been in my jewelry box ever since, I just never gave them back. So, thanks, Mom. They're, they're very nice pearls. They're very, they're, they're real, real pearls. Um, um, uh, however, you know, yes, these are not the ones, the actual string that is on the book cover, and nor, of course, are they the ones that in, have, are used fictionally in the 
um, in the story, but I will say frankly that some of the things that happen with uh, this, a string of pearls and with other objects and whatnot in the story, you know, might make one question whether it was a good idea to wear them later. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's yes, it's that kind of book. Um, but you knew that, right? Uh, you know. It, so when people said, um, you know, oh, you're writing a BDSM romance, that sounds perfect because, after all, I've been a BDSM educator and, and erotic writer for over 20 years. Um, I think some people still weren't really prepared for how how much sex is in the book, and it's interesting because this this is this is a theme that I have seen you know over and over again in my career is that I I write more sex scenes where more happens than a lot of writers do, and I, I've always felt that it, 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 there's a the part of the difference between romance and erotic romance. You know, romance can be very erotic and have, you know, can have, obviously sex scenes occur in them and, you know, whatnot, but because the fo that's but that's not necessarily the focus. In erotic romance, just like in erotic literature, you know, the actual erotic action is the action through which the character is revealed and through which the uh, the plot really takes place. And given that this is a, you know, contemporary romance, as I was saying before, I felt a little self-conscious writing a sort of real-world story. It's like there's no space aliens, there's no magic spells, there's no, um, you know, like, like the plot is these two characters getting to know each other, you know, for the most part. So it isn't like um, there's not going to be an alien invasion, there's not going to be, um, there's no curse to be broken, you know, <laughs> so it's like the, uh, it's a little, it's a very different kind of book to be writing than, you know, when you're writing science fiction and fantasy, it's like, oh, you know, in The Prince's Boy, the characters are on a quest, you know, they're trying to defeat evil, you know, and whatnot, and here it's like, uh, and now we're getting to know each other. Um, you know, so it's, you know, it's a very, very different style of writing. Um, I wrote it in the first person from Karina's point of view because I really wanted uh, the reader to just be able to have direct access to what her thoughts are. And she's, she's a fairly reliable narrator. Um, you know, she's learning as she goes along, but she's, but there are times when she's clueless and she's like, what the hell was that? And, you know, at times when I think, you know, a reader might also be like, what on earth is going on there? You know, and, but that, that gives you an idea that, oh, she's going to find out the answer. You know, she's not going to leave you hanging. Um, some of the answers won't come, of course, till books two and three, but, you know, it's, uh, that was sort of the idea. Um, hang on, I'm getting a text. Okay, that one isn't a that isn't a question. I'll just I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Thank you though. <laughs> um, I'll put that number up again. Anyone who want to text me a question? It's that's my phone number. Um, or log in. You know, create yourself a little free login on UStream, and you can get in this little social stream here. And so there's a little chat tab, and you can type in the chat, and I will I will answer. Um, um, let's see, hopefully people are able to jump, jump hopefully people are able to jump into this um, as we go along. All right, I'm going to read a little bit more, I think. So, um, in the previous hour, I did a Google Hangout, and I read a piece of the, um, a little piece of the manuscript. Um, I'm going to read a little bit more. This one is not available anywhere else other than in the book. So, um, there is a, a, about a chapter and a half the first chapter and part of chapter two um, on my website at ceciliatan.com so you know if you want to read it but then I wanted to read a little something more something special for people in the chat um, that isn't available elsewhere let's see and now I've got to figure out so uh, this is during one of their early dates so James and Karina if you missed the earlier chat met at a bar where she was ser she's a waitress she's a grad student trying to get her uh, degree in art history. She's studying the pre-Raphaelites, um, the pre-Raphaelite painters in particular, um, and he's a mystery. All she knows is that he's, uh, you know, he's obviously very rich, and he was sitting there drinking alone, and she, um, you know, they started flirting, and, you know, it's a romance novel, so, you know, it's not a surprise. <laughs> if they get talking, it leads to more things, um, so forth. Uh, one of the things she learns immediately, of course, is that he's he's a little quirky in s certain ways. Where he's like, you know, do you want to um, do you want to play a game? And you know, they she's like, what are the rules of the game? He says, well, they're you know, I tell you what to do, and you do it. 
uh, you know, that's it. And then she says, oh, what do I win? And he says, well, I'm a genie, I'll give you a wish. You know, that sort of thing. So, um, uh, initially, the things he has her do are not overtly sexual, but of course they progress to that. So, now they're actually going on a date where he has told her beforehand what to wear, but he's given her sort of sketchy instructions on what to wear. But she's kind of figured out the fact that he has not mentioned underwear means that she, so she's decided not to wear any. You know, she's wearing this um, mini skirt and uh, stockings, you know, but, uh, you know, like the real stockings with garters and whatnot, but she's, um, you know, so, okay, so anyway, here's the conversation where they're in the limousine on their way to the, where they're going. She doesn't know where they're going yet either. <clears throat> he, drew a, <laughs> he drew a handkerchief from his breast pocket and dabbed his forehead. Nice to see I wasn't the only one affected. They've been talking for a little while. When he composed himself, he said, Tell me what you have on under the skirt. My heart rate was already fast, but it sped up even more with excitement. Well, you didn't say to wear any panties, so, so I thought I shouldn't. Is it really that you're such a good girl that you sh thought you shouldn't, he chuckled, or that you're a dirty girl who hopes I'll do wicked things to her? Can't I be both? His grin was of delighted surprise, and he put a warm hand on my shin. Indeed, my sweet. Life's full of people who want to split me thing, everything into either or, when in so rea often, in reality, and would serve them better. Perhaps that should be our motto. Forget or. Embrace and. I like both, so let's have both. His hand smoothed up and down the stocking, a sensual touch that felt so different from a caress on bare skin. You appear to have followed most of my instructions to the letter. Should you get a reward for that? Shouldn't I? Except you did wear a shirt, and I don't recall telling you to do that. Damn, he had a point. Well, I had to wear something or get arrested. Did you know it's legal for women as well as men to go topless in New York City? He said wryly. Oh, really? Who knew? Did you actually want me to run half-naked to the car? His hand drifted up my stockinged knee. I want to see what you're not wearing. I froze, not because I didn't want to show him, but because I didn't know how to do it without looking like a dork. Put your feet in my lap, he said helpfully. I kicked off the pumps and settled my feet in his lap, my upper body leaning back against the car door. I could feel the seriousness of his erection through the soles of my feet. Now spread your knees. My cheeks went hot as I did it, and I had to look away. I hadn't ever simply showed myself that way before. My wide-open crotch was staring him in the face. May I point out that you are dripping wet with desire, he said. Thank you? I blushed harder. That was a compliment, right? Yes, it was, my sweet. He settled his warm palms against the insides of my knees. It reassures me that you like this game. As for whether I wanted you to run half-naked to the car, the sight would have pleased me surely, but your choice to wear a shirt is more prudent and gives us more options for where to go this evening. After all, restaurants may refuse service to those without shirts. This is part of the game. My requests won't always be clear. You have the choice to ask for clarification, or to interpret what I've said to the best of your abilities. Your interpretations are part of the pleasure for me. When you interpret things in a way that pleases me, you're rewarded. Choose a way that displeases me, and you'll be punished, which I'll enjoy in any case. Asking for clarification is not an admission of defeat, but be warned, even the clearest answer may be open to interpretation. Okay, damn, I mean, yes. One of the things he's told her to say yes instead of yeah or okay. His thumb rubbed back and forth at the edge of my knee, and I shuddered as if he were rubbing something else. Do you want to close your legs, he asked then. Are you uncomfortable? Yes, I'm uncomfortable, but that doesn't mean I want you to stop. I forced myself to look at his face. He met my gaze, seemingly more interested in my expression than in my exposed private parts. Tell me your fantasies. Haha, <laughs> get my PhD, a fabulous job, and a penthouse apartment, I joked. Are these merely fantasies, he answered with a smile, or are some attainable? Well, the Ph.D. would be in art history, and I'm close to finished. Unfortunately, I don't know too many art history types with penthouses. And, well, who even knows if I'll be getting that degree now? Just thinking about it was a downer. Can we talk about that later? Of course. Would you like to answer the original question more seriously? Which question? I would like you to tell me one of your fantasies. Sexual fantasies, if I need to be specific. 
He switched to his other hand and kept caressing me. I wanted him to touch me somewhere more intimate than my knee. After the way he'd touched my breasts earlier, I had a feeling he wouldn't be too rough or too impatient. Oh, geez, I don't know. I racked my brain, trying to at least make up something that would be sexy and sound interesting. I used to fantasize all the time when I was a teenager. I didn't know anything about what sex would be like, so my fantasies were always very vague. And then after starting to have sex, I, I don't know, there, there really isn't much to tell, I blushed. I've fantasized more about you in the past three days than I have about anyone else in the past three years. There it was again, the, oh really, eyebrow? Seriously, but I keep stopping myself. The eyebrow went even higher. Why? Because I get the feeling the real thing is going to be better than any fantasy I could come up with. Refreshing, he said with a nod, but the fantasy doesn't have to be physical. I'll let you close your legs when you tell me one fantasy of yours. I watched his gaze drift down my legs and my wide open lips and my clit throbbed as if his fingers were brushing it. Then he looked back at my face and I had to come up with something to say. I guess when I was a girl, I, I had romantic fantasies at least, if not sexual ones. Go on. Although, who knows, maybe that's the whole point of fairy tales. They're actually about sex. We just don't know. We're, we're hardwiring our little girls to mistrust older women and to, to crave getting pricked. Karina, you may indulge in a feminist critique of your fantasies later. Tell the fantasy first. <sighs> Prince Charming, I said almost in a whisper. whisper. Cinderella, the night at the ball, him kissing her foot. I don't recall Prince Charming kissing Cinderella's foot. Er, well, maybe that's only in my fantasy version, then. He smiled. Perfect. As you're not sure whether closing your legs is a privilege or a punishment, I have one more request. Yes? He opened a small compartment in the back of the front seat and pulled out an ornate box. He flipped open the lid. I could see a pair of marbles, these larger than the previous one, with more swirls and colors inside them. Have you heard of Benoit balls? he asked mildly, tilting the box at an angle so that the light glinted off the glass. I've, I've heard of them, but I wasn't sure they were a real thing. Quite real. Supposedly brought to Europe from China in the 16th century. They can be made of solid jade or metal with chimes inside, or glass, like these. He held the box toward me. Traditionally, they are for one thing. Female stimulation, I guessed? Insertion, he said, voice roughened by desire. I'll leave you off there. <laughs> Uh, before I violate the terms of service uh, <laughs> of, of Ustream. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, yes, of course it goes there. Um, now I guess I could tell a, a, a true story. Um, uh, <laughs> a true story about myself and, uh, and glass Benoit balls, um, which is basically boils down to they can get stuck. <laughs> Um, so I recommend, if you are going to play with glass Benoit balls at home, put them in a condom first, because then you have something to yank on when you, yeah, so, uh, I don't know if it's just the way I'm shaped or what, but they can get sort of vacuum sealed in, in the interior, and, and they're very difficult to, very difficult to remove sometimes, and, I mean, you know, maybe it's just that I have, the, uh, like, an iron grip or something, but, um, yeah, this was in the 90s, and I was, um, home alone, and, you know, just, I don't know, when you're an erotica writer, you um, have to take care of your own needs sometimes, shall we say. And, uh, and I ended up getting a fairly large glass marble basically stuck inside myself. And I kept thinking, I'm sure if I go to the emergency room, that, that they'll have seen this sort of thing before. But I thought, you know, I just, I would rather not have to take the time and, you know, so forth and so on. I was living in, in Boston at the time, in, you know, in actual downtown Boston, and we're just not, you know, not looking forward to going through the triage at, you know, Brigham and Women's Hospital or something and being like, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> you know. So I, uh, I just um, eventually, eventually worked myself, worked it out, you know, got, got in the bathtub and put down a towel so that in case it came shooting out, it wouldn't crack the, <laughs> crack the marble.
you know, I st I have this marble somewhere. I should have I should have brought it so I can show it to you. But um, so so people say, well, where do you get the ideas? What you write about? I mean, you know, a lot of them. Some of them are just stuff I make up, and then some of them are stuff that just you know. I'm like, this has to find its way into a book at some point. And that was you know, here 15 years later, I'm. I'm like, oh, you know, that thing with the glass was really fun. And what's interesting is that there's so much glass, there are so many glass sex toys that one can actually buy now um, that are, you know, perfectly safe to use. They're, they're dishwasher safe. This is great. It's like you can buy these Pyrex, you know, toys and then um, disinfect them by running them in the top rack of your dishwasher. Um, I know. <laughs> you know. So, you know, in the 90s, that was, it was, uh, you know, that, that wasn't yet a thing, and now it's sort of like you can mail order them um, ev everywhere. Uh, so, you know, interesting. I'm like, oh, you know, Pyrex, oh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's safe to heat up and make cold and whatnot, and there's, there's I, I'm sure there's some how-to books out there on, you know, how to use them and whatnot, so. Elizabeth <laughs> says, for varying values of fun. Yes, yeah, sir. I, I mean, so the thing about getting a getting a glass marble stuck is that I, it's fun to tell the story now that it all worked out, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, you know, it was not fun at the time when it was happening, except that I was like, you know, yeah, okay, as long as this all works out, this will be a great story to tell later, and the funny thing is I haven't told the story in years and years, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, yeah, so, true, true life, uh, true life stories sometimes work out in books. I, um, uh, does anyone have any other questions? Please feel free to, to throw them in. Um, text me or, you know, put them into the little chat stream here. Um, I had a list of questions I had written down earlier, actually. What did I do with them? Um, uh, this is the problem with doing live chats is that I buried it on my desk already. Um, I should mention, so uh, so the, the ebook of Slow Surrender is out now. Um, it's on sale basically pretty much everywhere ebooks are sold. I mean, you know, Hachette is a major publisher, so they're, um, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, I think, you know, whatever. I haven't even found all the places it's on sale. Google Play, etc. Um, the paperback comes out August 6th, so um, the first place I'll have them for sale um, where I can autograph them hopefully will be at the Geeky Kink event um, in New England, which is August 16th through 18th, I think. It's in uh, it's just outside Providence at one of the airport hotels. So if, if you Google geeky kink event, um, you should find the information about it. Um, so I, I am, I guess, uh, going to be participating as some form of pervert of honor at it. Um, so uh, I, I will, I should have, hopefully will have received my copies by then and will be able to show them off. Um, and uh, then the book two, because it's a trilogy, because everything has to be a trilogy now that Fifty Shades of Grey was a trilogy. Um, the book two will be out January 28th, uh, 2014. So that's in about nine months, I guess. You know, don't read too much into that. <laughs> it's, that's, that's how long it takes to, to make a book. And that will be both the ebook and the paperback of book two will be out at the same time in January. And then book three, they haven't given me the date for yet, but it'll be sometime next year. I'm assuming another nine to ten months later. Um, book two is actually with my editor right now. She's she's uh, she's editing it um, to give me back one, one last round of comments so that I can... Um, uh, yeah, let's see. What, el what else can I put my poor character through? <laughs> you know, so... so I find writing um, writing submissive women, you know, submissive and masochistic women, um, to be quite fun. But it, it it can get a sort of perils of Pauline kind of um, you know ethos to it. But you know, but that's kind of for me that is kind of the fun. It's like what kind of compromising you know predicament can I put her in next? Um, and you know, and how hot can I make it? <laughs> you know, that's to, that to me is the is that's the challenge. How how much higher can I keep setting the bar? Um, you know, and then. Uh, that, yeah, I don't know. That's to me. That's all the fun, and it's one of the reasons why the book starts as tamely as it does. Maybe you know is because oh, it's going to take a while to go where it's going to go, but it's going to go some fairly intense places. Um, so, and I want to, you know, I want to just didn't want to scare people off right away. In the same way that James does not want to scare Karina off. You know, he's he he's very taken with her right from you know sort of first sight. Um, so and. Is curious, you know. Well, let's see what what happens. Um, 
So much will be revealed about him and his motivations and his hang-ups, you know, and, and whatnot as time goes on, um, as the books go on. So, pardon me while I pour myself a little bit more tea. I spent all last week in bed um, sick, basically. It was not fun. Um, the uh, whatever the, the the cold is that's going around. I picked it up at the fetish fair flea market actually in February. Um, I, I uh, directed a big fetish event in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, we had about 3,000 people there, um, you know, and uh, it snowed even during that weekend. Not one of the heavy snows, but, you know, so it was pre pretty cool that 3,000 people came out just to, to try on corsets and, and go to classes and, and try out floggers and, you know, um, I, I, you know, I sold books and, you know, went like that. It was a, a good time. The flea market's been going on in New England now since... Let's see. This was the 40th one, so and we do them twice a year, so it's been 20 years. Um, and yeah, I started the very first one, ran it myself. It was a fundraiser for NLA New England, and then you know I was dragged onto kicking and screaming onto the board of NLA New England at that point. And then um, I got off the board a couple of years ago, but have you know stayed involved with the flea market. Um, if you are in New England and you would like to be involved in making the world a safer place for people who are into BDSM, that is the statement of purpose of the New England Leather Alliance. We incorporated in the state of Massachusetts and so we changed our name from NLA New England to New England Leather Alliance. Um, NILA has a lot of ways to get involved. You can you know, everything from, okay, there's no licking of envelopes anymore because, like, everything's on the internet, and so we don't mail out a newsletter and stuff like that anymore, but there are, there are monthly board meetings. Um, we put on two flea markets a year. The next one's coming up June 29th. Uh, it'll be in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, um, at a place called the Frank Jones Center, which is literally right off of the highway, um, and it's sort of behind, a, it's a little hard to see from the, the, the highway, but it's, um, uh, but yeah, the FJC and Google Fetish Fair Flea Market and Neela on the web if you uh, want more information. And that'll be a one-day one, and then we do a weekend-long one um, uh, in Providence, usually the usually the, the weekend closest to Valentine's Day. So um, uh, we're not selling tickets for next February's yet. But but yeah, so I got I, I picked up some kind of sinus infection or con crud or something at this last FFF, and um, and I'm still not better. <laughs> it's like. Oh, winter in New England. Now I know why people move to Florida, right? Um, my parents moved to Florida, and I'm going to visit them next week, or actually later this week, so. Uh, perhaps that will cure me. <clears throat> but yes, I don't often have such a Lauren Bacall-like voice. It's that I'm, uh, you know, it's that I'm still getting over this cold. <laughs> so, I know, colds are not sexy, so you need to talk about something else. <laughs> mm. Let's see. Um... Oh, actually, I, my phone buzzed with a text earlier. Okay, so this, this text consists of one question. The question is, pre-Raphaelites? Okay, so <laughs> I have to explain the whole thing about pre-Raphaelite art. So here's the thing. So, uh, you know, writing a romance novel, it takes place in New York City. People are familiar with New York. The two characters are, you know, real people. They're not space aliens, angels, vampires, anything like that, right? And, um, you know, normally I write a lot of science fiction and fantasy. And I thought, okay, since the plot of this novel is essentially just how these two characters get to know each other, the sex that they have, the, the sort of ever-escalating intensity of the BDSM interaction between them, <coughs> they have to have something to talk about besides sex and their relationship, you know, like, and, and it can't be current events because, of course, you want people to be reading the book to think uh, it's happening now. So I didn't want to put anything in that would date it to, you know, 2012 when it was being written. So I thought, okay, um, what can I do that, that I have to give them something to talk about? And I said, okay, I'm putting, putting her in grad school. She has to be getting her thesis, she has to be writing her thesis about something. And I just sort of, out of the blue, I was like, how about pre-Raphaelite art? Okay, that sounds good. And, I, and it was kind of in the early stages of the proposal. Like I hadn't yet really thought it through. Like publisher buys the proposal, they accept the book, they say, okay, we want you to you know, write the book. So now I'm now I'm writing the whole manuscript, and of course I'm like, okay, well, you know, pretty Raphaelite art, all right. And <laughs> looking up, you know, I've got a couple of books, and you know, this and that, and looking on the web, and you know, whatnot like that. 
And of course, uh, it turns into a whole theme in the entire book. I mean, it's like, you know, nothing, nothing you give to yourself. One of my old writing teachers um, said, you know, these are the gifts you give to yourself. And, you know, it turns out, of course, that there's these really, at least I see, some, some really strong sort of bdsm -y themes in a lot of the Pre-Raphaelite paintings, um, you know, and there's, in, there's one painting in particular that they talk about, you know, um, and it was like, I couldn't go into too much detail because people are buying the book to read a romance, not to read a lecture about art history, you know, but I, but I couldn't, once I came up with these sort of connections between the parallels between the characters and these characters in the painting, you know, and look, um, I was like, this is, you know, I have to, I have to talk about this. Um, and there's this sort of, a, a, in the scene that I read where she talks about Cinderella having this sort of Cinderella fantasy, um, the, uh, one of the paintings that I was looking at is, there's one called King Kofatua and the Beggar Maid, and comes from a, 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 a there are there are songs and poems and you know whatnot sort of depicting these two. Um, <laughs> yes, I thought you might be going for a kink connection with the Pre-Raphaelites. There is a so this is the thing. So King Kofatua and the Beggar Maid by um, Edward Burne Jones is this painting that so the, the so the the story is basically this sort of a, a, a proto Cinderella story in which. This king supposedly looks out his window and sees a beggar maid so poor that her clothes have fallen off of her and is so taken by her beauty that he, you know, like this sort of love at first sight that he, you know, take, takes her in and makes her his queen, right? So numerous, very, you know, numerous versions of the short story, you know, in, in, in ballads and, you know, so forth and so on. And there's numerous paintings um, of it. Uh, and Burne Jones's painting of it is he doesn't just take her in, uh, he exalts her. And it's, it's almost like one of these religious, uh, you know, compositions where she's, she's up high in the painting and he's down in the bottom. And it's this king, you know, and he's wearing, and he's wearing this black leather armor. You know, I'm not making this stuff up. He's wearing this black leather armor. He's got his lance between his legs. <laughs> he's got his crown off and he's sort of gazing up at her you know, adoringly, and I'm like, I'm not making up any of this stuff, you know, this is, this, so this is, this is, you know, this unbelievably powerful masculine figure who is brought low by the beauty, you know, of this innocent, you know, beggar girl who is, you know, obviously not from his class, not from his world, not from, you know, whatever, and I mean, in, in the painting she's wearing sort of some, some form of clothing, um, but it's, uh, it's what to the Victorians would have looked like underwear, I think, you know, so, you know, but it was sort of interesting because, of course, in the, in the, in the story, as I saw it, you know, told again and again, it was that she had no clothes, you know, and so this is after he's put some clothes on her, you know, <laughs> whatever, um, but, uh, you know, that, it, so, and I said, that's what's happening here, you know, our, our powerful, dominant, you know, billionaire man is completely taken with this you know, um, with this young woman who does not know yet what power she holds and how strong the power is she holds over him. Um, and that, you know, she doesn't know the, yet the, the power of love. And, you know, um, so it's sort of, uh, that's, the, that's the theme of the novel. And so here it is in pictorial form in this <laughs> painting. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I have to mention this painting, obviously. Um, the funny thing, here's, here's another one thing about conjuring things into existence that, you know, it's like, so one of the things I have happen in the book is he introduces her to a, a, a an art curator at some point from England. Um, because they have to, they have to talk to somebody besides each other and they have to talk about something besides sex, right? So at some point he introduces her to this curator and whatever, because it turns out he has these art world connections, you know, whatnot, right? So, um, and book two takes place in London and what I have him it, it have happen is that this curator, I made him a curator at the Tate, and I said, oh, we're going to have this special exhibition of pre-Raphaelite art, and he needs an, sort of an expert on the pre-Raphaelites um, to, but he needs an expert who's not a British citizen, because he, he has special donors who have given, you know, whatever, obviously this is not the real 
this does not really happen at the Tate, as far as I know. <laughs> you know. This is completely my fantasy, you know, whatnot. So he brings her over for the summer to give these special private tours, um, you know, after hours. Uh, and the, um, you can see where my fantasy went. Um, and the funny thing is that, I, so I went to England last September for a, uh, for a conference. And um, at that time, there was no exhibition of pre-Raphaelite art. There were, you know, there were some here and some there. And, and this Burne Jones I knew was in the Tate. And so I go to look up, I said, I have one day in London, you know, I had passing through on my way to this conference, which was in York. And I said, okay, in my one day, let me see if I can see this painting. And I go to the website and I'm, you know, looking up information on visiting the Tate and what's happening there. They've just opened a massive exhibition of pre-Raphaelite art. And it, you know, <laughs> so it's like, oh my God, I did it again. I made reality conform to my fantasy. Um, so they had this huge exhibition. 150 paintings. I spent four hours in there easily, and easily two hours of which was just looking at the Burne Jones paintings, which are the, the, the crowning jewels of the entire thing. It's, they're in the last room, the last thing you see, you know, and it's just like, oh my god. Anyway, um, that exhibition actually is on tour now, and I think it's in Washington, D.C. right now. So if any of you are in the D.C. area and want to see this painting, and it, as with many of the great great works, seeing photographs of them does not do it justice. Even seeing high quality reproductions in books does not do it justice compared to the, what the real thing looks like. It's just, you know, unbelievable. Um, anyway, <laughs> so yeah, so you know, it's like I think I write fiction and then these things that I make up just happen. So yeah, I don't know. Um, it's just how it, <laughs> just how it works. <laughs> Someone else who's, who's writing says, I deny your reality and substitute my own. Hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> yes, so actually I'll talk a little bit about that colloquy thing that I did. Um, another BDSM romance that I wrote recently um, for a company called Colloquy. The, the book is called Entwined, or the series is called Entwined. This one is called Unbound. And then each of the four writers who are in it wrote a separate piece. I wrote the piece called Dear Girl because it's an actual sort of British British BDSM, you know, scenario, whatever, in which our our American heroine gets together with this mysterious, you know, billionaire, as usual. <laughs> For some some reason all these guys into BDSM, yeah, um, are are billionaires or or at least millionaires. Um and uh and he calls her Dear Girl. Um so that's where the, the title comes from. And um uh so what's funny about this is so we were each of four different writers wrote four different versions of the story and then they have a website where readers of the book can go and write their own endings also and I went and read a bunch of them and they're, they're, they're fantastic. One of them has her coming home and getting it on with the doorman at her building and you know it's just like I, fantastic. I, I love that kind of stuff. Um, so all right Susan says write me a story about me getting rich. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we'll work on that. <laughs> I've been, I've so here's one of those things. I took, I got an MFA, or actually, I ended up getting an MA. But you know, I was in an MFA program um, in the '90s at Emerson College. When I quit my day job in book publishing because I wanted to write full time, I said, oh, "I'm going to go to writer boot camp." Basically, like people were like, "Oh, why don't you go to Clarion?" You know, and whatnot. I'm like, "No, no, no." You know, like six, eight weeks, not enough for me. I wanted two years. <laughs> you know, <laughs> two years to find out could I write enough in, you know, two years to finish the degree and, you know, really, you know, I said, I can't make it as a writer if I can't make it through writer grad school, basically. So I, this, I went, so I went to grad school and um, a lot of my grad school stuff is in Karina's novel, obviously, because, it, because she's in grad school. So I, um, you know, and one of the things they tell you in these writing workshops is that wish fulfillment is bad. And what they don't tell you in these writing workshops is that every rule that they give you is that it is something that is bad in the hands of a writer who is not a very good writer. Um, you know, so they so they tell you things like don't ever write about a writer. And you're like, but you just said write what you know, and I'm a writer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and stuff like that. So you know, and then you look at books, you know, what which are the books that have won the prizes, you know, so forth and so on. Of course there are some that are where the main character is a writer and you're like, you know, well, how come Martin Amos can write a book where the re main character is a writer? Well, Martin Amos is an award-winning writer and it's like, well, how do you get, you know, 
this is these are the things that when you're young and impressionable, you know, they start telling you things like, well, they also tell you don't write science fiction or fantasy, don't write this, don't write that. The only thing that's really acceptable to write is literature, but um, the thing is the kind of literature that is written in MFA programs is itself a genre. And um, and I could have written a thesis about that, but then I thought that's nah, going to really get me in trouble. Instead I ended up writing a, a thesis about the history of circlet press, which is my um, my my small science fiction company, um, and I basically wrote a uh, history of the erotic within the fantastic literature. So you know, the history of erotic science fiction, such as it existed in the early '90s, um, which was to say there wasn't much of it. You know, at the time there were there were some touchstones where different things had tried and different writers had tried and whatnot. Paranormal romance didn't even exist yet, though, as a genre. Let's put it that way. So this mixture of the fantastic with the with with the erotic or with BDSM was like, you know, it was like mixing peanut butter and chocolate. Like no one had done that. How could you do that? And then of course once we started doing it, people were like, oh well, that makes perfect sense. Um, so you know, but they tell you these things though. So they, they tell you wish fulfillment is bad, and um, and I'm like, no, I think wish fulfillment is one of those strong paints on the palette that you can't overuse, or you'll it'll be bad. But if you use it properly, you know, you you. If writing is an act of communication, and what we're trying to communicate is to create an experience in the reader that is, if the craft is about creating the experience that you, the writer, have in mind for the reader, as opposed to whatever the reader has in mind, then, you know, nothing is really off limits in that case. You know, it's not like, oh, there's words you can't use. It's like saying there's letters you can't use. Don't use those letters of the alphabet because the, you know, I, honestly. So, you know, you, you learn what what the rules are and then you learn how to break them. And um, one of the early stories that I wrote, one of the early meta stories, I guess, that I wrote is I wrote this erotic, uh, I wrote an erotic story about Derek Jeter. And those of you who follow my blog and whatnot, know that I'm a huge baseball fan, and in the olden days, I, I was not yet a professional baseball writer at that time. I was just, you know, I had a little write baseball blog and, you know, whatnot like that. I didn't think I'm going to end up, you know, actually, uh, you know, the, the now longtime editor, I'm the longtime editor now of the Yankees Annual, which is an annual magazine. This year it came out from Lindy's and was called In the Dugout Yankees, but same, same magazine I've been editing um, for many years um, and whatnot, and that, you know, that I would become a real professional baseball writer. So, you know, but I wrote this, I wrote this for a, there used to be a zine in the 90s called Starfucker that was <laughs> uh, published by a, a great woman from San Francisco named Shar Rednauer, and it was basically all real person fic. It was all sort of fanfic about real people, um, you know, but it wasn't coming from the fanfic community. It was sort of like she was doing it uh, sort of on her own as this, just this, the zine, you know, sort of photocopied and stapled, you know, and whatever. And I wrote her, um, and I said, do you do, do you ever do sports figures? You know, like most of them were, were musicians and, you know, TV stars, and movie stars. And I said, hey, what about sports figures? And she's like, oh, we don't, we've had hardly any of them. And I'm like, oh, I'll write you, I'll write you a sports figure. And she, um, actually then sold the rights to the best of sort of Starfucker for an anthology from Allison Publications. So this was actually in a book in bookstores that was, you know, in Barnes and Noble and, you know, whatnot like that. So it was this 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 Derek Jeter and me story, basically. But because it I was so aware that what I was writing was supposed to be this kind of wish fulfillment that the story is self-aware, in which I say things like, you know, so the first time we met was such and such, you know, the second time we met what was it? I think the line is something like, the second time we met, I was out with my best friend um, celebrating the sale of her screenplay, <laughs> you know, that kind of a thing. And it was like, you know, I'm like piling on the wish fulfillment. It's like, okay, so now my friend has sold her screenplay, and then I ran into him by the restroom, you know, <laughs> kind of a thing. And so, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's like, you know, it's so, so, hey, it could happen. I could write a story about you getting rich, and it, who knows, it could, it could come true. Uh, you just, you, you can't tell. You never know where fiction, the where fiction and reality are going to intersect is, you know, is always going to be an interesting thing. So, um, my, uh, what, so what I haven't decided is exactly, in book three, I know what's going to happen, what I haven't decided is where it's going to happen. So, book one is New York, book two takes place pretty much in London, with a little bit in New York, all in, again, in places that I've been to, um, 
cafes that I've eaten in, you know, this, that, and the other. I just, ever since getting, you know, a phone that is a digital camera, it's like I'm just, everywhere I go, it's research for something, for some story, some time, you know. So I haven't decided where, where book three is going to take place yet. And, um, I mean, it would be sort of a cop-out to set it in Boston because that's way too easy. So that's where I live. Um, so I don't know. It might have to be L.A., but I'm not sure. I don't know. I haven't, thematically, it will, the story will eventually tell me, you know, no, this is where it needs to be. So I haven't, haven't decided. It may end up back in New York also, it's possible. Or it might end up like in Ohio or something, which is where her mother lives. And, um, or maybe they're going to have to travel around between all these places. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Um, given that I uh, am still writing book three right now, I don't, I don't have to answer those questions just yet. But I don't know. Maybe I'll make a, I'll put a poll up on my website and say, where, where should book three take place? But maybe I'll wait till after book two is done <laughs> so people can see where, where it's gone. I don't know. This is the fun part um, in some ways when a book is so young and new, the, it's like the clay is still wet and you can still move it around. And you can still change things. It's like there are some things you can't change that are in, in the spine of it. And then there are other things that are really malleable. And um, I find it very exciting. Um, uh, the problem sometimes is that then as you go along, you know, and you're, you're, you're sort of baking it, is that it, it gets hardened and then you suddenly realize that you've gone off in the wrong direction or something and you kind of have to shatter it and start over. And uh, um, uh, hopefully that will not be happening since this will now be book three of a series, you know, and so it should be, so the shape of it should be fairly well set. Um, definite things that are going to happen. Um, but so much, I, I still get to decide things like, yeah, where it happens still is, is up, up for grabs. Um, all right, we're coming up on time. So um, I've got about five minutes left. Any last questions, get them in now. Um, let's see, what, what can I tell you? Anyway, Slow Surrender, the book is out now in ebook. The paperback will be out August 6th. Um, Book two, both the ebook and the paperback, will be out January 28th. And then, like I said, book three is still yet to be scheduled. Um, they won't schedule it until I actually turn in the manuscript. So, I know, funny, funny how that works. Um, and we don't have cover art for book three yet either. We have a, um, they did send me a, a, a draft of book two, though, which still has the pearls, but the pearls are off the string. They're sort of rolling around on silk and I'm like, you know, separate and I'm like, oh, this fits my theme. This fits my theme perfectly. So, you know, I know it's funny. It's like, it's like, it's almost abstract art. It's, uh, but it fits. So I don't know. I'm very happy about that. Um, working with a big publisher is interesting because there's so many people involved in the project. You know, it's like, I've got two different publicists, an editor, there was a separate copy editor, separate proofreader, the art department is a whole other department, you know, whatnot like that, and it's sort of like, um, it's like the difference between making a YouTube video and then, you know, like going to make a film and there's, where there's, you know, a cameraman and a lighting person and a costume person, you know, and whatever. It's like all of a sudden there's this whole, um, uh, this whole sort of staff, you know, <laughs> involved in it. It's just like the emails are going around constantly, you know, we're all CCing each other about different stuff. And, um, it's fun to have a team, though, because it, I'm so used to doing self-publishing and, you know, small press publishing where you, I have to do everything myself, you know, and that, that, and I'm obviously, I'm still, I set this chat up myself, you know, so forth and so on. I am still doing quite a bit myself um, because today as an author, you have to, you can't just sit back and wait, you know, the publishers don't have the resources to do it all either, you know, and they don't, they're not the ones who have access to the people who have been following me, you know, for 20 years of my career, so. You know, my social media obviously is my friends and my family and my readers. So, you know, they don't they don't have any of that. So um, that's why I get to do cool stuff like this. Let's see. Sorry, I have a cat. Um, <laughs> I guess the closing message is um, follow me on you know whatever social media you want, uh, and I will probably do this again in August when the actual paperback comes out and then I'll have an actual book that I can like hold up and point to. Um, the, uh, let's see, closing message. Closing message is, you know, yeah, I guess that's the theme, right? Is that you fantasize things and they become real. And I, I'm not the only person who does that. So, you know, you imagine the love that you, um, that you need or that you want. You imagine the people in your life 
who, you know, would, would make you complete, it, it, it works. If you can imagine them, they will come true. They will come to you. Um, and uh, that's what I've done over and over. I mean, Corwin, my partner who has been with me now, we're coming up on our 22nd anniversary. Um, the second story in Telepaths Don't Need Safe Words is about him. And I wrote it before we got together, and I essentially conjured him into my life. Um, yeah, so so it it really works. You know, it it actually it actually really does work. Kind of interesting. So thanks for being with me tonight, everyone. And um, again, if you want to ask me questions about BDSM, writing, romance, anything like that, Google me and drop me an email, and I will see you around. The